This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here and another action packed week of space news. There has been no shortage of developments with the Starship construction at Boca Chica as we also count down to the launch of SN5. We've had another beautiful flight of the Falcon 9 with the launch of Anasus 2. The Hope Mars mission launched as well this week with the Japanese H2A rocket. A few updates to share on the Solar Orbiter mission and for once a little rocket development news from Australia of all places. Another super busy week at the Boca Chica site around the preparation for the 150 metre flight test for Starship Serial Number 5 or SN5 for short. Early in the week we started off with a fuel test of sorts which was all in preparation for that next step of the static fire to come at a later time. While we were awaiting that milestone there was no shortage of work going on with the next new Starship. Another new nose cone was again spotted which is starting to lead many of us to believe that many of these are test nose cones in order to find the correct method of manufacture. There are many more nose cones than are needed at this point in time and we all know that in the past the nose cone sections have been one of the most challenging to build due to the highly complex curves in the steel required to create such a shape. Now along with that a new common dome was spotted there by Mary that indeed looks to be the common dome for Starship Serial Number 8 which as far as we know is being constructed next to the SN6 here in the mid bay. This common dome was rapidly sleeved and will form a part of this latest Starship stack very soon I'm sure. This segment fits between the liquid oxygen and the liquid methane tank and it's open like this due to the smaller header tank that is placed within that section there. Now one of the most exciting things for me this week was seeing these robots arrive on site. Now although we've seen a lot of examples with robots of this nature performing welding jobs, such robots can be used for a variety of automation tasks. This could well mean that the more manual prototyping manufacturing methods are about to be replaced by rapid automation construction techniques. KUKA robot systems here are in the business of doing just that and these robots don't mess around. It will be very interesting to see what improvements these units will make and hopefully SpaceX will be open in sharing information with us all on their use in the future. Interestingly another Raptor engine was spotted on the scene midweek as well. Not real certain where this little beauty is heading at the point of recording here so if you've spotted more information on this let us know in the comments. Now interestingly the fins from Starship Mark 1 that we were looking into from last week's video have now been mounted into this structure here and the word on various forums do seem to share the consensus that this is going to form part of an outdoor pavilion area or perhaps a building for food preparation. They've been playing around with lighting here as well so it may likely form part of an entertainment area to add some extra pizzazz for Elon Musk's next Starship presentation which we hope will be occurring in a few months time. Now back on July 22nd Elon Musk here was sounding quite certain that the 150 metre hop test for the SN5 should not be far away saying that SpaceX will attempt to fly later this week. Since then of course we haven't seen a static fire and due to strong weather rolling in the new forward dome that has been constructed during the week here for serial number 8 has been moved indoors to keep safe and the nose cones shown earlier have also been rolled inside for the same reason. We're just going to need to wait this weather out I'm afraid. Again Elon Musk's timelines here a little optimistic. Hopefully though as soon as that weather is behind us a static fire will occur and that 150 meter flight shortly after. This coming week is going to be a big one. The new high bay has continued to make rapid progress with that second level being built on top of the first here throughout the week. Given that the full scale super heavy booster is going to be around the 70 meter tall mark, the high bay here is expected to reach around 80 meters tall which is going to tower well above the mid bay there which we believe is approximately 45 meters tall. I just can't wait to see a super heavy booster begin construction. That really is going to take things to a whole new level again. To a certain extent the monster body itself is a much simpler vehicle than the Starship with the exception of the extremely complex engine bay that will need to withstand the enormous thrust of 31 or more Raptor engines everything above that should be much more straightforward. While on the subject of the Super Heavy again some amazing imagery here by Neopork showing some renderings of the Starship and Super Heavy to scale here from a number of perspectives. The passion and patience involved with the members of this space community doing this work is truly incredible showing that human for 
scale here really helps to put it into perspective too. And as far as we can see from the community on Twitter, they are just loving his highly detailed renders and he's planning on going ahead and taking it even further. Go and follow him there on Twitter for more awesome space art. Thanks as always to Mary aka Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight and RGV Aerial Photography for keeping us updated with the goings on at the site. Always appreciated. And if you want to know more about the Starship development and other space news, please do consider subscribing. And if you visit often, taking a second to tap that like button. It really does help to promote the video to a wider audience. Now the HOPE mission, which is otherwise known as the Emirates Mars mission and the first Arab interplanetary mission, launched from Japan this week aboard a Japanese H-2A rocket operated by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. The launch vehicle consists of a first and second stage with two solid rocket boosters. Topping all that off, of course, with a fairing covering that payload with the vehicle standing 53 metres in height. Hurtling out over the Pacific Ocean on its climb out of the atmosphere, the heavy launch vehicle propelled the payload into Earth's orbit and here it waited for the precise time needed to fire that upper stage and push the probe on a precise path to Mars at a velocity of 11 kilometers per second. Now by February 2021, HOPE should begin the orbit insertion phase where the velocity is bled off to enable capture by Mars's gravity. Half of the fuel on board will be spent as the thrusters burn for approximately 30 minutes which will slow the spacecraft to around 18,000 kilometers per hour. They'll need to do this otherwise the probe will slingshot around Mars and head off into deep space, not what we want to see. More tests and verification will happen over a six week period before the probe transitions into the science orbit which is an elliptical orbit ranging between 20,000 kilometers to 43,000 kilometers in altitude with one orbit taking around 55 hours. HOPE will spend around two years orbiting Mars as it gathers invaluable scientific data and this will be the first continuous global observation of Mars's atmosphere and weather. Contact with Earth will be limited to twice a week for up to six to eight hours at a time and it's anticipated that HOPE will transfer over one terabyte of science data during these communication opportunities. For such a young space agency to perform a mission of this magnitude in just seven years blows my mind and while SpaceX will have the physical means to land on Mars, what better way to understand the Martian environment in advance of a crew mission than to be able to draw from the data that will be made freely available to all scientific research communities. Now some updates on the Solar Orbiter mission. This wonderful joint mission between NASA and the European Space Agency launched in February 2020 on United Launch Alliance's Atlas V rocket. Solar Orbiter was sent on its seven year mission to study the Sun in more detail than ever before, including the first direct pictures of the Sun's poles. Its trajectory is unique and in order to view the solar poles, it needs to modify its orbit to rise above the ecliptic plane by using the Earth and Venus's gravity to slingshot into a steeper angular orbit of approximately 24 degrees. The Sun's poles are thought to possibly hold the keys to a better understanding of why the Sun behaves like it does. The Sun's magnetic poles flip every 11 years with a peak in solar activity recorded before this mysterious event. Solar Orbiter not only hopes to unravel this mystery but also to analyze material ejected from the Sun which is known to have a negative impact on Earth communication systems and also for those living in space of course. Now every six months Solar Orbiter will eventually end up passing by the Sun even closer than Mercury does, experiencing temperatures over 520 degrees Celsius at a distance of around 42 million kilometers or 26 million miles. So this past week what we saw was the first release of images from Solar Orbiter captured in June with its first pass of an approximate distance around 77 million kilometers or 48 million miles away. And wow, these are just incredible. Scientists have already seen tiny light flashes or nano flares that they're calling campfires like we see here. These sparks seen for the first time are thought to perhaps be part of a process which heats the corona, the sun's outer layer of its atmosphere, to a temperature that is some 300 times hotter than the actual surface of the sun. Solar Orbiter's mission has just begun but already it's providing incredibly useful data. The onboard equipment is being tuned and calibrated at these initial close approaches in preparation for the serious science to begin as the vessel continues future passes. 
This week we witnessed another beautiful launch of the Falcon 9 with the Anasus 2 mission, which is a South Korean communication satellite. This satellite was destined for a geostationary orbit, which of course has an orbital period equal to the Earth's rotation. Essentially that means that when in its operational position, it appears fixed in the sky for all of us down here on the ground. The booster for this mission was the very same booster that not so long ago launched Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley up to the International Space Station. That same booster with the worm logo on the side. So yes, this was the second flight for booster B1058 that made its first flight on the 30th of May, so just 51 days between flights, which is a record for SpaceX with the previous best being over 60 days. Also interestingly, as shared here by Julia just after the launch, this booster also broke the shuttle Atlantis turnaround time, which is a great milestone alone. This is yet another great example of how SpaceX are not only reusing vehicles, but increasing the reliability and speed that they can reuse them. This is an extremely important step prior to future vehicles that will have the potential of full reusability, such as the upcoming Starship that we've been watching so closely. Of course, as we all witnessed, the booster landed successfully on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions over 620 kilometers or 385 miles downrange. The booster's last landing was on its sister ship, Of Course I Still Love You, so this one had the pleasure of meeting both drone ships downrange now. The bigger recovery news, however, was the recovery of the fairings. SpaceX up to this point had really only caught a few single fairing halves out of the air, with most others being recovered from the ocean directly. This mission, however, was totally different. The recovery ships Go Miss Tree and Go Miss Chief were out again awaiting another catch attempt, one ship for each of these fairing halves, which are ejected shortly after stage separation. Because the fairings are ejected a little later in the flight, these ships need to be even further downrange, at roughly 780 kilometers or 484 miles. The announcement was made by Elon Musk shortly after the launch, saying both fairing halves have been caught from space by SpaceX ships, which was met by a great deal of excitement by the space community because we've been waiting for this for what seems like quite a long time now. SpaceX later tweeted the video proof of both ships there catching the individual fairing halves awesome work. At around 26 minutes into the flight, the second stage needed to boost the payload into that geostationary transfer orbit, and after a 56 second burn of the Merlin vacuum engine, another 2.5 kilometers per second of velocity was added to extend that apogee up to around 42,000 kilometers in altitude. The deployment of the satellite for this mission, of course, was not shown due to customer request, but just after 32 minutes into the flight, the separation was confirmed, and that was the end of the live stream. And just as with the launch, almost every photo out there was capturing the footage from the SpaceX logo side of the booster. Being the booster with the worm logo, I searched far and wide and bam, both Julia and Greg here, both awesome enough to have found their way around to grab a shot from this perspective. Congratulations again to SpaceX for yet another incredible Falcon 9 flight. As always, a big thanks as well to Greg Scott here, who was out at the launch site taking some incredible shots of this mission. Follow Greg there on Twitter for more amazing updates coming photos. Now, for the first time in a long time, something worth including in space news from Australia. You know, that pretty big landmass that half the world's population seems to confuse with Austria. Very different locations, by the way. But yes, the Australian rocket company Gilmore Space Technologies in Queensland has just recently achieved one of the longest hybrid rocket engine test firings in the world with this 110 second mission duration burn of its upper stage engine. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but real quick, this video is sponsored by Brilliant who have been incredible supporters of my channel here. In this current age of amazing online content, it is no surprise that people are taking control of their own learning in favor of outdated forms of educational content. For the many people out there searching for great online math and science resources, you can't go past the offering here with Brilliant. If you are a professional that wants to catch up on the latest topics, a student looking to push ahead, or someone who just wants to learn how the universe ticks, you should check out this incredible content. Every time I revisit the courses here, I find some amazing topics I didn't even know that I wanted to know more about. Before I know it, I am knee deep in content that blows my mind. Take this course on waves and light just as an example. When you think
think about it, everything that we see or hear is made up of waves. And as we dive deeper into this subject, it isn't long before we can understand at a deeper level how noise cancelling headphones work or how light travels through space over vast lengths of time. And who knows, maybe you'll gain a whole new passion for astronomy by getting up to speed with that subject matter. If you're naturally curious and you want to build your problem solving skills, then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new every day. Thank you very much to Brilliant for their support of my channel here. And if you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try, head to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. You can head there from the link in the description below. So yes, Gilmore Space Technologies in Queensland, Australia is pioneering new single port hybrid propulsion rocket engines that are claimed to be significantly cheaper, greener and safer to operate than traditional liquid and solid propulsion rockets. Unfortunately, a lot of the detail on the engine itself is proprietary, so I can't tell you much about the fuel mixtures, efficiency or anything fun like that. But what we can see here is a throttle test of the smaller upper stage engine. This 110 second full length burn is the same length of time that will be expected for this final stage to deliver customer payloads into their specific orbit. The controlled throttle down during this test here demonstrates the engine's ability to perform on-orbit manoeuvring, which could be useful for surface landings on the Moon or Mars in the future. Now, this is an interesting company to watch over the next few years as they fully recognise that launch costs and availability are two of the biggest hurdles for small satellite customers that are deploying new technologies into orbit. The Ares orbital rocket is intended to offer more affordable, reliable and dedicated launches into low Earth orbits from 2022 onwards. So if you happen to live down under here in Australia and are interested in a career in this amazing new space race we find ourselves in, Gilmore Space Technologies is currently hiring. You'll find more information on that at gdspacetech.com forward slash career. Now, if you remember a few months ago, I featured a reproduction of the Skylab space station made by Gameplay Review UK. And since then, this guy has been busy pumping out a plethora of fantastic replica craft in Kerbal Space Program. His best one yet probably is SpaceX's Crew Dragon replica here. So as we'll soon be witnessing the real return of this mission, I thought it would be worth a shout out there. Of course, it wasn't enough for him to just build a fully stock life-size scale replica of the Falcon 9 and Dragon 2 spacecraft. He's also gone ahead and built the most accurately detailed stock international space station that I've ever seen for it to dock to. Now if you love to learn how to do these things in KSP go check it out, the link for that is also in the description. Finally, it is of course worth noting that we've just the other day seen the Soyuz launch with the Progress MS-15 mission. These awesome shots from Ivan up on the International Space Station amazingly managed to capture some shots of the launch, including the separation of the first stage. There we go there. You can see the Korolev cross if we zoom right in there. How cool is that? All seems to have gone smoothly with the mission, with the exception of a few little issues with the docking around 20 meters out. They did get there in the end though, docking successfully shortly after. And although it was a little difficult to cover in any depth, a launch here by China's National Space Administration launched their very first interplanetary mission to Mars on the Long March 5, which is apparently the heaviest payload ever sent to Mars in one launch because it contains an orbiter craft, a lander as well as a rover. It's going to be interesting to watch this mission play out as it heads towards Mars as well. Now just quickly, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. I simply can't do what I'm doing here without you. Your generous support has allowed me to increase the time I can spend on this content, and I can't thank all of you enough for that. Further help just allows me to do even more. And if you like what I do, and you'd like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included roles in Discord. You can check out some exclusive patroning content. You can also have your name listed right here, like this other list of incredible people. With that, a massive thank you as well to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of it, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking a bunch of topics, including a flashback to the undignified return to Earth of Skylab. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching as always, and we'll see you all in the next video.